God, thanks for this time we have to look at your word. Uh, We pray that everything that comes from your word, because uh, you care about us so much, that it's something that hits us right where it needs to and speaks to us exactly the way it needs to. And we pray our hearts are ready for it, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. It's really easy to lose focus, isn't it? I don't know if uh, if your schedule is busy like most people's are, but because we're busy, it's easy to lose focus. And, and I've, I've seen on the internet these things called, you only had one job. I don't know if you've ever seen these pictures, but these are pictures that were taken because people at work had lost focus, and this was the result of their losing focus. So here's an example of somebody who lost focus at work. I'm a little confused. Do I just stand here? What do I do? Do I go in or out? Uh, enter only, exit? I, I don't know. Somebody, you only had one job, and you obviously got it wrong. Here's another one. Somebody got wrong. <laughs> now, I'm kind of skeptical about this one. I think this is probably Photoshopped, but then I think it is the internet, so it's probably true. <laughs> so this probably really did happen. Then there's this one. You only had one job. I don't know what to say. I mean, let's not say anything. Let's just go on. How about this? You only had one job. So this guy goes into Starbucks and they say, well, what's your name? And he says, well, my name is Mark with a C. (laughs) And this is, this is my favorite. You only had one job. (sighs) Isn't that, that's, For some reason, to me, that's disturbing. I don't know. There's something about that picture that is disturbing. Nobody's going to eat a filet of fish sandwich the same way ever again without having that picture. You only had one job. It's easy to lose focus, isn't it? I mean, in the real world, and we know what the real world is because we're in it, the real world is working more than 40, 40 hours a week. It's sometimes working 50 and 60. The real world is maybe you're trying to juggle your job and home, your family, you've got a number of kids, you're trying to get to different places. In the real world, we know what this looks like. We have a lot of single parents, and when you're a single parent, you're juggling your job, your kids, taking care of the house, taking care of the finances. I mean, all of that is on you. There, There are all these things that compete for our time, and it's easy to lose focus. And one of those things we also have to recognize, too, is some of you all, some of us, some of you all are, you like the chaos. Can we just, you can, you can admit that. You like things being busy. You like going. You like moving all the time. You like doing all the time. And so chaos is, is no big deal. But the problem is it's easy to lose focus. And spiritually, it's never a good idea to lose focus. And because we live in the real world, it's really easy to do. When you live in the real world, it's really easy to lose focus focus. There was a letter written to people in the first century. It was a letter written to people who were followers of Jesus, uh, but they had previously been of Jewish heritage, of Jewish faith, but they decided, okay, I believe this thing about Jesus. I want to follow him. But they've gotten to a point in their journey and their walk that all of a sudden they're thinking, it might be easier for me to go back to things the way they were. It might be easier for me to go back to living the way I used to live. They had lost their focus on Christ, and so this letter was written to them to encourage them to keep their focus on him. And I think a lot of us know what that's like, because it's easy for us, because of the busyness of our lives, to lose focus. It's easy for Jesus to become part of our life, part of our focus. It's like we've compartmentalized him. We've got family, work, money, all these things, and Jesus, he's compartmentalized But when we've compartmentalized Jesus, we've lost focus on Jesus. So that's why this letter was written. It's a letter we've been looking at for a while now. We're in the middle of this message series called Greater. And we're looking at how Jesus is greater than anything else. And if you have your Bible, turn to Hebrews 12, look at verses 1 through 3. It's on page 844 in the Bible in the chair in front of you. If you don't have a Bible, you're welcome to keep one of those. Uh, We buy them, not so we can hold on to uh, they're, not, they're not something we want to keep. We want to get them out. So take one if you need one. But look at Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 on page 844. Now, this is going to be in the English Standard Version. 
There's a number of different versions. This is the one I've, I've gonna, I'm going to be using for this message. It says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider, consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself, so that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, when you lose focus on Christ, I think there's some important lessons we can take from this passage that the writer is speaking to us. One of those things is this. Do you realize that we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses? Last week, we looked at Hebrews chapter 11, and in Hebrews chapter 11, there's, this, there's all these names of people whose stories we read about in the Old Testament. People like Moses and Abraham and Sarah and Rahab the prostitute and Samson. And what makes their stories so compelling when we read their, their stories in the Old Testament is not that they had their act together. What makes their stories so compelling is that these people were so flawed. I mean, they were so imperfect that it's natural for us to just relate to them so easily. But what we see is, despite what they've been through, despite who they are, they have decided that ultimately God is worth more than anything else, and focusing on Him is their greatest focus. And the writer of our passage, the writer of our letter says that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And these cloud of witnesses, because it's kind of like the cloud idea, they're above us, they're not just down here with us, they're up above looking down, that this great cloud, this cloud of witnesses is looking down on us and saying, don't stop, keep going, don't give up, keep your focus on Christ. Like I said, this great cloud of witnesses are probably some of these people who we're talking about in Hebrews chapter 11. People like Abraham and Noah and Sarah are looking down on us and saying, keep going, don't give up. Now, I don't know if they're looking at me individually saying, Barry, keep going, but I think they're able to at least look down upon the church as a whole and they know what life is like and they look at us and they, from their perspective, from their heavenly vantage point, they see everything we're going through and they say, we know it's hard, but don't give up. Don't stop. Don't quit. I mean, if you had a moment and time with these people, they probably wouldn't say to you, wow, you're doing a great job at work. You know, I mean, fantastic job. You know, you're, you're just doing, killing it at work. Or you got, man, your, your yard looks so beautiful. What they'd say to you is, no, no, you don't understand. There's this and there's this. No matter what this does to you emotionally, physically, spiritually, mentally, don't give up. This is so much better. There's this great cloud of witnesses looking down on us. But I don't think those cloud of witnesses are just people from the Old Testament. I believe that part of that great cloud of witnesses looking down on us are those people that we know who have gone on before us and are now in eternity and in heaven with God. Like for me, like my mom passed away when she was 27 years old. I was nine. That was 53 years. That was 44 years ago. I'm 53 now. 44 years ago, I imagine my mom up in heaven going, Barry, keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. I mean, I've got four grandparents that have passed on. I imagine them in heaven saying, Barry, don't stop. Keep going. Don't give up. My wife and I would have a 22-year-old child right now. I don't know whether it be a boy or girl, but a child who would be 22 years old, but who saw the lights of heaven before this child saw the lights of the delivery room. And I believe because this child in the womb is a living soul, just as a child outside the womb is a living soul, that this child is now in heaven cheering us on. Dad, keep going. Mom, keep going. Austin, Jake, Aubrey, keep going. This child's got, I've got sisters-in-law now. Hannah, Maddie, keep going. Don't stop. Don't give up. I've got this idea that, that this child is cheering us on child is part of the great cloud of witnesses. Who's cheering you on? Maybe for you it's a mom or a dad. Maybe for you it's a grandparent. Maybe for you it's a child. Maybe for you it's a husband or wife. Who's cheering you on? And just to know that they're cheering us on. When we're going through these times when life is, tra life is difficult and tragic and hard, 
to know that this great cloud of witnesses is looking down at us from heaven saying, don't stop, don't give up, keep your focus on Christ because following Jesus is worth any price. Who's cheering you on? Don't give up. Another thing this writer says to us is that Jesus is greater than anything else I or you could ever want. Jesus is greater than anything we could ever want. I was having a conversation with my daughter a couple of months ago, and it wasn't me describing this to her. She was describing it to me. She says, you know, there's a difference between wanting to want something and wanting something. Let that sink in. There's a difference between wanting to want something and wanting something. Let me, let me explain it to you this way. If you go to a restaurant and you get the menu, they now have your regular options and they have healthy options, and you want to want the healthy options. You're wanting to want like the chicken, the grilled chicken and the steamed vegetables and the raisin skins or whatever it is they throw in with that. <laughs> whatever that healthy option is. But what you really want, you want the deep fried triple cheeseburger and the chili cheese fries. Am I right? You want to want what's healthy, but what you really want is not necessarily always good for you. And when we look at this passage, what we see is that we sometimes get in this, this mind frame for what we want to want is good things. It's like we want the spiritual things. We want God to be moving and working in our life. But what we really want is something totally different than that. We want to want to have a deeper relationship with Christ. But what we want, because what we're giving our time to, our money to, our energy to, is something totally different. What this passage says is we need to lay some things aside. If you don't want to want to have a deeper relationship with Christ, there's probably some things you need to lay aside. If you really want to have that relationship, you need to lay it aside. There are things that we need to lay aside. We need to set some things down and move on in life without them. This passage says not everything that holds us down is sin. That's an, that's a, it's a very important thought because what we generally think is this. You know what? If it's not sin, it's not bad for me. But what this letter says, it says, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily entangles. Not everything that comes between us and God is sin. Some things are just weights holding us down. But we've be become convinced that if it's not sinful, it's not bad for me. But the enemy is wh of what is best for us spiritually can be something that is better than sin. The enemy that is not good for us spiritually can be something that is better for us than sin, like being entertained. I mean, if you make entertainment, which is not bad in and of itself, the most important thing in your life, more important than Christ, that's not good. That's a weight holding you down. If you're making money, which is not sinful in and of itself to make money or have money, but if you're making money more important than Christ, that's a weight you need to lay down. I'm going to say something that we, we all go, really? Family. We all have families. We love our families. We love taking care of our children. We love doing things with them and providing for them. But even family, if it becomes more important than Christ, has become something that's gotten out of order, and it causes problems. Certainly, it's not a sin to have a family, so how do you lay your family aside and move on? We're not talking about laying aside your family. We're talking about laying aside the priority of your family over God. God doesn't expect us to give up our family. God expects us to take care of our families. But we should lay down the priority of putting family above him and our pursuit of family above our pursuit of God. We just, we have to lay some things aside. And some things that hold us down are sinful. We got to lay aside the sin that so easily entangles. The message says, calls it the sin that so easily trips us up. For years, I've been a big fan of Oswald Chambers. He wrote a devotional book years ago called My Utmost for His Highest. I highly recommend it. But he was talking about temptation, and let me describe temptation real quick for some context. If this is us and this is sin, to get to sin, what draws us towards sin is, is that temptation. Temptation is that which is drawing us towards sin. And so that's why this is so relevant for us, because we find that sin easily entangles us. And Oswald Chambers says this, Temptation comes to me, suggesting a possible shortcut to the real, uh, realization of my highest goal. It doesn't direct me toward what I understand to be evil, but toward what I understand to be good. Temptation is something that confuses me for a while, and I don't know whether something is right 
or wrong. You see, what happens is, what draws us to sin is that it seems good for us. But it eventually enslaves us. It entraps us. It becomes a weight. It becomes a burden. It becomes an addiction. And all of a sudden, we're like, how did I get here? It easily entraps us because we become convinced that it's good for us. And the writer says, we need to lay those things aside. We need to lay aside everything that keeps our focus from being on Christ. How do we do that? I want to read Hebrews 12, the next couple of verses from the message for you. I I love the way this speaks to us. It's just a modern language translation. It's not always the best one for translating from, uh, you know, to, for theological purposes, but sometimes for just practical stuff, it's really great. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race for him. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed, that exhilarating finish in and with God. He put up with anything along the way, cross, shame, whatever, and now he's there in the place of honor right alongside God. And when you find yourself flagging in your faith, go over that story again, item by item, that long litany of hostility he plowed through. That will shoot adrenaline into your souls. I mean, the writer of Hebrews says, we need to think of life like a race. Life is not like a sprint. It's like a 100-yard dash. It's like a marathon. It's a long race. And it's hard, and it's long, and there are obstacles. Just like life. And sometimes we need to get this perspective, I'm just in a race. And I need to keep my focus on the finish line because Jesus has been through it. And he's there on the other side of this finish line waiting for me. One of my favorite stories occurred back in the 1992 Summer Olympics in Barcelona. Derek Redmond from Britain was hoping to win the gold medal in the 400 meter dash. He was the record holder from Britain. But during the semifinal heat, if you remember the story, on the back straight, his tendon snapped and he fell to the ground in a heap. And it was an incredible, intense amount of pain, just unbelievable agony that he was in. Well, Derek Redmond got up. There was no way he was going to actually win the race, but his race wasn't over. He got up. He began hobbling. He hobbled 50 yards. By the time he got to the 200-yard mark, everybody else had finished the race, but Derek Redmond kept going. He waved off medics. He waved off doctors. He said, I'm going to finish the race without him, without you. I'm going to finish this race. He got to the 100-yard mark, and he realized at that point that he wasn't alone on the track. His father, Jim, had come up alongside of him. And he put his arm around his son. He said, son, you don't have to keep going. And Derek Redmond said, dad, I want to finish this race. And his dad said, well, we started all this together and we'll finish together. And arm in arm, through tears and agony and pain, they made their way slowly but surely to the finish line. Somebody else finished first in that heat that day. But Derek Redmond, he finished with his father. There are other people who are going to finish this race before you. But are you going to finish with your father? He never gives up on you. He's always right there to help you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you've been through, he's always there ready to put his arm around you saying, son, daughter, we started this together. Let's finish it together. Life is like a race. And I have this idea that God is going to move and work in our lives as we finish this race together in amazing ways. It's because God does everything for at least a couple of reasons. One is for his honor and glory, and the other one is because he loves us so much. I want to tell you a story that happened. It's a true story. It happened a few years ago when I was a, a minister in Virginia. I was a preacher at a church there, and we had a men's, a men's camping trip, and, and I had a four-man tent, but I didn't want to take a four-man tent. I mean, guys don't share tents when you're on a camping trip, so I went online, I went on Amazon, and I found a single-man tent for $26, and I ordered it, and I brought it home, and I set it up in the basement, and I got inside, and I said, okay, this will work. Well, I got to the camping, tri- got to the camping trip that night, set it up, got in, put all my gear in, and as I was laying there, I, my head... Was, was hitting the top, and my feet were at the bottom, touching the other end of the tent. And it was just, it was just, it was a little small. I mean, 
the fact that it had Disney and like Ariel on the side of it should have <laughs> given it away. But no, actually, it was like a real tent. And you know, I'm like six foot three, so um, I shouldn't have been too surprised. Okay, I'm five nine. So actually, in all honesty, I'm five foot eight and fifteen sixteenths. But who's counting? But I should have known, okay? So at the end of this whole thing, I pack up the tent. I'm kind of disappointed. You know, I'm not going to be able to use this tent. I can't, you know, it's just too small. So I take it home. I put it on the shelf, and I think, okay, uh, I, I'm done with that. A couple of weeks later, I'm having lunch with this guy who comes to our church. At one time, he'd been homeless, but he had gotten involved with the Roanoke Rescue Mission, and, and he started coming and attending our church. So I said, hey, let's go out for lunch. And uh, after lunch, he said, you want to see where I used to stay and it was an old abandoned factory, and I said, well, yeah, I've never been over there before. So we drive down this deserted road and look around, and he said, you'd be surprised the number of people that actually stay in this, in this abandoned factory. And as we're leaving, as we're driving away, there's this guy walking down the street towards us, and, and Danny says, hey, look, there's so-and-so. I don't remember the guy's name. He said, look, there's so-and-so. He used, we used to stay in there together. I mean, we would sometimes, it'd be so cold, we'd have to huddle together to stay warm. And he rolls down the window, and he, he says, hey, so-and-so, and this is Barry. He's my preacher, and, uh, you know, we make small talk. And he says, great seeing you, and he rolls up the window, and I drive off. We drive off. And you can imagine, I mean, I, start, I started to feel convicted. Not guilty. I don't think God wants us to feel guilty. I think God wants us to feel convicted. And I felt convicted that I hadn't done anything. And that Wednesday night, I, I was teaching a, a class, and I said to my my group, I said, you know, you guys just need to be ready because God is going to give you an opportunity to make a difference in somebody's life. God's going to give you an opportunity to, to, to do something. And I said, I blew that opportunity, but I think God's going to give me another one. And he's going to give you one as well. And he's going to give you one this week to make a difference in somebody's life. The next day was Thursday. A guy called Glenn, a guy from a church named Glenn, texted me. He said, hey, Barry, I, I left my Bible in the auditorium. Could you check to see if it's there? At least I think it's there. And you got to understand Glenn. Glenn is like a man who was once an alcoholic who had been pulled out of that lifestyle, totally turned his life around, gave his life to Christ, was doing an amazing job ministering to people who were having hurts and habits and hang-ups. He helped start a celebrate recovery group at our church. Just a huge heart for people who are having difficult times. And his Bible was there in the, in the windowsill. And I took it and put it in the lobby, and I put it on the counter, and I texted Glenn. I said, hey, Glenn, your Bible's in the lobby on the counter. He texted back, he said, great, I'll get it Sunday. Next day's Friday. Friday's my day off. Uh, Lori and Aubrey and I decided to go get some dinner. And at the same time all this is going on, we're renovating our auditorium. So we're putting in new carpet, new chairs, painting, all kinds of stuff. So it's Friday night after dinner. I usually didn't go to church on a Friday night, but I said to Lori, I said, hey, let's go to church. Let me show you what they've done in the auditorium. So the three of us go over there. We pull into the parking lot. I noticed the light in the lobby is on. And, and I'm walking up, we get out, and we're walking up to the lobby door, and I notice the door is ajar. It's just slightly open, which is normal because this door needed to be fixed. It, it just wouldn't close properly. Sometimes the swing and the closure aren't strong enough, and so it, it doesn't quite connect, and so it just kind of hangs open. So I get ready, open the door, and this guy is sitting in our lobby in a chair who I don't recognize, and he jumps up, and he runs over to the door and startles me, and he says, Hi, my name's Tommy. I said, hey, Tommy, um, I'm Barry. I'm, I'm the preacher here at the church. He goes, hey, I hope you don't mind. Um, and I could see all his gear, all his gear on the floor. He had like a backpack and some other stuff. He goes, hey, look, I hope you don't mind, but I, I'm walking to North Carolina, making my way to North Carolina. And I was walking by your church, and I saw the name of the church, which is New Hope. And he said, uh, I walked by, and I saw the name of your church, and I decided I needed some hope. So I came to the front door, and, I, and it was open. And, and I just came inside. And he goes, I walked around looking for somebody, and I couldn't find anybody, but I did find your kitchen. And I ate like four corn dogs and, and, and had a bunch of your sweet tea. Is that all right? I said, sure, that's great, no problem. And he said, after that, I came back out here, and I was just sitting here, and I saw this Bible, and it was Glenn's Bible. And he said, I opened it up, and I started reading it, and I think I want to be baptized. And I said, Okay, let's sit down together. I want, I want to make sure you understand what you're doing. And we opened up the book of Romans, and we kind of pointed ourselves toward Jesus, 
And at the end of about 20 minutes together, I said to him, I said, Tommy, do you still want to be baptized? He said, yes, I do. I said, do you want to make Jesus your leader and forgiver? It's not just about being baptized. It's about making Jesus your leader and forgiver, making Jesus your focus. Tommy said, I want to do that. So I took him up to get changed. He put on a T-shirt and shorts. Uh, I, I got ready for the baptism. Uh, I walk out. Tommy is wearing shirt, shorts, and socks. And uh, we both meet in the baptistry, and it was freezing cold. But there in the baptistry, Tommy repeated the same words of profession of faith that I did years ago when I was like 10. I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and my Lord and Savior. And Tommy repeated those words, and I took him under the water and brought him up. And he raised his arms, and Lori and Aubrey were sitting in the auditorium, and they started yelling, Woo! Tommy! And we hugged. And then after that, he went and changed, and um, we met back in the lobby. And I said, you know, Tommy, um, you, don't have to, you don't have to walk to North Carolina. I mean, if you want, there's a place here. There's a rescue mission, which will take you in. You can stay, and they can feed you, and, and that's a great place for somebody who's going through what you're going through right now. And he said, no, no, I want to I wanna keep going. And I'm looking at Tommy, and I'm thinking, Tommy, you're only about five foot four. <laughs> I've got a tent that would be perfect for you. <laughs> and I sent Lori home to get that tent, and I said, bring all the granola bars you got. And her and Aubrey went, and they came back. Later on, she said, I was so nervous leaving you there with him. I'm just glad you were alive when I got back. <laughs> but we loaded up Tommy's stuff. Uh, he tied the tent onto the back of his, his backpack. We walked out the door. I did make sure that it was locked. But he went left, and, and we went right. I think about Tommy, and I think his race, his journey, looks so much different from mine, and, and probably yours as well. But yet God loves him no less. There's this passage in, in the New Testament, 1 Peter 3, 9, where it says, God is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. See, what happens is we're going on this journey, we're on this race, and sometimes we're running in the wrong direction. And repentance is to turn around and say, the way I'm going is not the right way. I need to follow Christ. I need to make him my focus. And I think about Tommy, and I think, you know, I don't think all those things that happen, all those seemingly appear, the things that appear to be random things were accidents. I think there's a way that God kind of orchestrates things in our, in our life so that, so that we can see him clearly, so that we have a choice. I think God loves Tommy that much that he was willing to do anything to draw Tommy closer to himself, including all the things we just talked about. Uh, God loves us that much, but here's, here's the thing. He gives us a choice. Tommy had a choice. Tommy had to choose hope. Tommy had to choose Jesus. Tommy had to choose baptism. And we do too. Somebody said God can do everything except God can't do the most important thing. God can't make you love him. Oh, he could. He could. But he chooses not to. He wants that to be our choice. So your choice is... Are you going to make Jesus the focus of your life or not? I can't do that for you. He won't do that to you. That is your choice. And he's worth it. He's worth it. Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this time we've had together to look at your word. My prayer is for those whose faith is, is waning or flagging to be encouraged. My prayer is that we would find encouragement from being part of a church where we're loved and cared for. But most of all, Lord, we'd find comfort and encouragement from being in fellowship with you because you love us so much that you sent your one and only son for us. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.